And with that, I would ask you to give a big welcome to Neil Bell of Oregon State University. Thank you, Janet. Am I on? Yep. Well, a burdening sense of regard. Yes, she's not feeling well, um, so she thought um, this would be difficult to, for her to do today. It's just, you know, one of those winter things. So um, I said, well, I originally came to Oregon back in 1990 to study the Marion Blackberry. So I, I come by my fairy knowledge both by osmosis, right? <laughs> my fairy birthday. Um, as well as by having um, actually done research on canberries in my own right. So, um, yeah, I thought it would be the uh, best thing if I just came down here and did the presentation for So, um, yeah, this is her presentation, though. Uh, so, uh, I will do my best to do it justice. Um, but what she was asked to do, what she's focused on, is not Mary and Blackberry or other Cambridge, but Raspberry specifically this afternoon. So I hope that's what everyone has come expecting to see. And this is just what you, one can do with berries in one's backyard. This is a nice little home in uh, Monmouth that she included a photo of uh, with a lot of raised beds and a lovely pink flowered uh, dogwood right there. So looking really good. Um, in, in the landscape. So, is this thing, is this working all right? Can you hear me? Or do I need to look? Okay. I can't tell from here. So, um, berries share some commonalities, regardless of what berry it happens to be, in terms of their growing uh, requirements. And by the way, if you have questions, I think the easiest way to ask questions is just go ahead and ask them as we go. Um, so, I just want to make that clear. So the one thing that raspberries and other berries are going to need is full, as full a sun as you can give them. Uh, meaning probably a minimum of six hours of full sunlight. And of course sunlight in the afternoon is a little bit more effective than sunlight in the morning, so the results will probably be better if it's afternoon sun than morning sun. Um, the soil needs to have good drainage. And so any spots in the garden where, really with any perennial crop, um, is uh, if there's any standing water in the wintertime at all, that's the red flag right there, especially for raspberries. There's probably few landscape plants which tolerate poor drainage less well than raspberries amongst woody plants in general. So soil that has good drainage, and by the way, clay gets a bad reputation for drainage, but clay, unless it's actually compacted, is a good growing medium, and that's most of what we're dealing with. Most of us deal with clay, and so a little organic matter, uh, a little bit of uh, cultivation, and avoidance of compaction are probably all you're going to need to turn uh, an average clay soil into a really good growing medium for any of these crops, even up to and including um, raspberries with some additional adjustments. The pH has to be within range for the berry type, as we'll see just momentarily. Uh, suitable organic matter, so again, clay, organic matter, they go well together. Um, irrigate well, so all of these are crops which do need summer irrigation, whether it's hand applied or whether you have a nice irrigation system. Summer irrigation is going to be required on all berry crops, including raspberries. And then pruning and training uh, for that particular crop. We'll go into details about the pruning requirements of uh, raspberries. And then fertilizer. Um, there's also a description of different types of fertilizers, both inorganic and organic fertilizers, uh, how and when, how much to do it, as part of this presentation as well. So that's pretty comprehensive. So as far as the nutrient or the pH uh, requirement is concerned, as you can see here, strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, all the cane berries, table grapes, gooseberries and currants, and kiwi fruit or kiwi berries, those are the hardy uh, kiwis, uh, are best grown in a soil pH of 5.6 to 6.5, meaning that almost all of us do not need to adjust soil pH for any of these crops. Usually you'll find your unadjusted soil pH is somewhere in the neighborhood of 6, but if it is not, either lime to uh, raise the pH or use elemental or ground sulfur to lower it. Um, blueberries are the ones that typically need some kind of uh, pH adjustment because the pH they re require between 4.5 and 5.5 is usually too low for most of our soil. So in most cases, uh, soil pH adjustment will not be necessary for raspberries specifically. <coughs> 
There are outstanding updated publications on the OSU Extension Publications website to download at no charge, by the way, on all of the berry crops. Uh, and those were updated very recently. They all date from 2020. So full color photos, updated information, all the cultivar information in particular is up to date because, of course, those are constantly changing, both for raspberries and for all the other crops. So good stuff to be had there for viewing or downloading as you see fit. So a lot of what I'll talk about is actually um, uh, available online. The other thing that uh, often people find vexing about berry crops, blueberries in particular, because of the nature of their growth habit, is pruning. Um, and so if you go to the uh, PACE website, or Professional and Continuing Education website at OSU, which you'll find under uh, Extension and Experiment Station, I believe it is, on the OSU homepage, you can find in the PACE catalog pruning courses for all of these berry crops. So if you're not clear on how to prune really any of the berry crops, grapes and blueberries are the two that are most often cited as being difficult for people to understand just because they, they tend to be very vigorous, particularly the grapes, and in the case of grapes can get completely out of control if they're not pruned. Then these courses, which are hosted by Bernadine, uh, are available. They're not, I think they're $50 a piece, at least that's the last I heard. I, I, I can't confirm that. But uh, yeah, that's, um, that's also a resource for you through the PACE website. Um, so have a look for that. Okay, so uh, the presentation today is specifically about raspberries, of which there are three main types. Um, and so all of them both share this one thing. What differentiates a raspberry from a blackberry is when you detach a raspberry from the plant, it leaves behind that receptacle, as it's called. So there's a hole in the fruit. So any berry crop like this, which actually has that hole, is uh, considered to be a raspberry. So the receptacle is the part on which the fruit develops. And then the actual fruit itself, uh, this is an aggregate fruit of many little droplets. Um, so uh, that's what constitutes a blackberry, that's what constitutes a raspberry. The difference, of course, is with a blackberry, you've got the receptacle still inside the fruit. By the way, fun fact, when I was a uh, graduate student, uh, one of my jobs with the Marion Blackberries, doing these yield components, it was called, is disassembling these individual fruit and counting those droplets. So <laughs> I've recovered from that experience, so but yeah, many wonderful hours spent counting and by the way, you do jot down as you go. You don't want to get to 200 droplets and go, well, was that 200 or was that 195? <laughs> but anyway, they have that in common. So the actual fruit, and that's why there's so many seeds, is each individual fruit has its individual seed. So as I mentioned, there are several different types of uh, raspberries. Uh, there are the red raspberries, which have both summer bearing um, types, which fruit from June into July in the Willamette Valley, and then there is so-called ever-bearing or primicane fruiting, as they're also referred to, which uh, fruit potentially in both June or July, but what most people think of as uh, the ever-bearing is the ones that fruit on the new growth in August to October. Uh, separate altogether from these red raspberries are black raspberries, one of which is native to the Willamette Valley. Uh, we have a native species, uh, Rubus lutodermis. Uh, which are summer uh, bearing in June. And then there's purple raspberries, which are hybrids between um, black raspberries and uh, red raspberries, which are also floricane fruiting in June and July. So uh, a full discussion would involve all these, but what we're going to focus on today is the red raspberries, both summer fruiting and ever bearing. So I'll go into more description about what that really means. So the red raspberries can be either summer bearing or floricane fruiting, um, meaning that they only produce fruit on the cane in its second year of growth. So in the first year, regardless of whether it's primicane or floricane fruiting, the current season's growth is referred to as a primicane, and in most cases it will not produce fruit unless it's or primicane fruiting. So it overwinters the following year, it produces fruiting laterals, and the fruit is born, and then that cane dies. So they're only, uh, the above ground growth of both uh, the primicane fruiting and floricane fruiting uh, are only two years old. They, they die after the second year. Primicane fruiting uh, are usually referred to as fall bearers, 
but also ever vary because of the way that you can manipulate the fruiting to provide more than one crop, which, we, which we'll talk about. So the primocane fruiting ones differ from the summer bearers in that they will produce fruit at the tip of that first year primocane. So that's what differentiates them from that. So there's different cultivars for uh, these two different purposes, which we'll talk about. So they'll produce fruit on primocane, and then if you choose to, you can uh, leave that uh, cane on the plant for that winter, and then it will produce, also produce fruit on the floricane like a summer fruit. So if that's not clear, uh, I will, uh, well, I will, I will via burn these slides, point that out. You know. And there are both red and yellow fruited cultivars of both primocane fruiting and floricane fruiting, red red. So, as I said, um, the roots and the crown, okay, are perennial. So they'll often be very long-lived. Um, they are kind of sort of, I mean, let's get into this. There, there are virus problems which can reduce the um, vigor of raspberry plantings, which limit their lifespan, so to speak. They just become less and less vigorous. But, you know, it's not unusual to get 15 years or so out of a red raspberry planting if it remains healthy and free of that uh, any drainage problem contributing to root rot. So the roots in the crown are perennial. They get larger and larger when you pass the year. The canes, though, are biennial. So whether it's a primer cane fruit or a floor cane fruit, the canes only live for two years, and after the second year, they're clipped out. So uh, the primer cane is the first year cane, which is usually vegetative. When it overwinters, it then becomes the floricane, and for the summer bears, it's on that structure that all of the flowering and fruiting occurs. So this is what it looks like, right, um, uh, diagrammatically. Here it is during winter, so if you've had your plants in the ground and they're summer bears for a couple of years, what you have then are floricanes, which will produce the fruiting laterals in the spring and then bear fruit in the summer. As that process is going on, you will have your primocanes also starting to grow for the following year's crop. So you get your fruiting, the floricanes die, and then they're removed. The primocanes grow up to whatever height they typically grow to. Um, and then in primocane fruiting types, they may fruit at the tip of that cane. In floricane types, they don't do that. They overwinter and bear fruit the following year, as we see, with, as we see over here. So that's kind of like the uh, Cliff Notes version of the difference between uh, primocane and floricane fruiting red raspberries. What that looks like in practice on a floricane fruiting or summer bearing raspberry is this. So if we finally get past this nasty cold weather uh, and get to spring, then around April or so, you will start to see this type of growth on your raspberry planting, which right now will be devoid of any leaves or other uh, evidence of growth. So once it's, this is a, obviously a somewhat mature planting. So these are your floricanes, which are starting to produce these growths, which will eventually become lateral several inches or maybe 18 inches long, which bear flowers and fruit at their tips. And so the majority of that will occur in this part of the cane. Sometimes you get them all the way to the bottom, depending on bigger and cultivar. So these are all floricanes, and they're just starting to produce the fruiting laterals. Down here are your primocanes, which are the canes for next year's crop. So they're just beginning to grow. So as the floricane laterals develop and flower and fruit, those primocanes are growing up. So by the time you get around to harvest, you've got this melange of both floricanes and primocanes on any given plant in your planting. So both of those have to be dealt with during the growing season. So a sucker, the one thing to remember about um, red raspberries is that unlike things like certain blackberries, the root system can produce vegetative shoots anywhere it happens to roam. So that's one of the things that need to be dealt with with red raspberries is the root system suckers. And as those of you who garden know, any suckering plant uh, offers a management challenge above and beyond anything which just produces growth from the crown. So these, these suckers just refer to uh, primocanes, which occur in places you really rather not have them. So, you know, any raspberry planting could become a thicket unless you manage the suckers, so that becomes part of the whole 
pruning and management plan is keeping the suckers where you want them. So both the frymocane and uh, floricane fruiting red raspberries produce these, and so they both have that need for... Um, so if you're looking at which cultivars to buy, this is lifted out of the red raspberry publication, um, and Bernadine purposefully put in the cultivars which are typically available nowadays uh, in retail nurseries or online sources. So uh, she specifically wanted me to point out the Cascade Delight, which I believe is a result of a breeding program in Washington. Both Washington and Oregon have a canebury breeding program. Um, is a very tasty cultivar of summer-bearing red raspberry. So some of these, it's kind of a mix of newer varieties and older varieties, and ones more typically found in colder regions than the West Coast. Um, but in any case, all of these should be available to you um, and are described in the publication as well. Cascade Gold, of course, is one of the yellow-fruited cultivars of, of a summer-bearing red raspberry. So you'll find that in the uh, Growing Raspberry publication. And then the same applies to the private cane fruiting varieties, uh, some of which are very old. Heritage is one that's been around forever, uh, but there are newer ones as well, and again, some of those are yellow-fruited as well as the more typical red fruit. So you can find this also in that same publication. So planting. So here's Bernadine herself, by the way, uh, in action, uh, planting some berries into containers, which is a great way to grow berries, by the way, if you don't have space in your garden or you've limited space and don't have a garden. Well, you can still grow these because the neat thing about them is most of the growth is vertical as opposed to horizontal. So she's growing these in these large tubs, but the same uh, information here also applies to planting them in the ground. Um, so if you're buying plants, uh, one of the things that we encourage people not to do is to dig up uh, plants from a neighbor's or a friend's garden and transfer them to your own garden. And the number one reason to do that is really soil movement. Because in soil, there's always the potential for phytophthora root rot. And that's one thing you do not want to move from one garden to another. And you just don't know what's in soil. So that is to be discouraged. The other reason is that um, as a planting ages, there's always the possibility that it is virus uh, infested, which means that it's already compromised in terms of its vigor. So it's far, far better uh, to go buy plants from a nursery that are virus-free and healthy and free of any um, disease problems, potential disease problems like Phytophthora rubra. So just do that, and you, the other thing is you can get your choice of cultivars, uh, which you know your neighbor may, may or may, may not remember what it is that they actually have. <laughs> Um, so, buy certified disease-free plants from a nursery and then plant in spring. So, sometimes this, this also applies to any plant, actually, that you either grow from cuttings or buy um, as a bare root plant, is it's not sometimes a bad idea to trim the root system to it fit into the uh, pot or, you know, growing environment you're going to put it. Roots respond to pruning the exact same way that the top of the plant does, which is by branching. So, it's a good way to invigorate the root system. Um, as well as uh, make it fit where it's supposed to go. So here's a planting that's going in the pot here, but think of this as being um, just the, the soil itself, if you like. And she's going ahead and putting in and is covering it up to the crown in soil. So the same will apply if you're putting it in the ground. So typically you buy raspberries in the springtime, they're dormant canes with the roots attached. So just the same thing that you saw there also applies to planting in the soil. Um, not a bad idea with red raspberries if you're not putting them through an um, actual raised bed with artificial growing media. If you're going into soil, also make yourself a raised bed because drainage is paramount with red raspberries. They are just so susceptible to phytophthora root rot. And I used to be, uh, from 2000 to 2021, the community horticulturalist in Marion County and Polk County. So I visited homeowners all the time to try and sort out their gardening problems. Um, and I can't tell you the number of times I saw phytophthora root rot in an in-ground red raspberry planting over and over again. Um, very characteristic, the most common disease problem with red raspberry. Yeah? How long can you keep them in containers? The question was, how long will they stay in the containers? Um, that's a good question, right? It would be a great question for Bernadine. She planted those, and they stayed 
viable, I would say, for about four years or so before they started to get tight in the pots. Um, I, I mean, it's a really vigorous root system, and that becomes part of the problem, is that it's going to fill that root, that fill, fill that pot in the first growing season. So then the question is, how long can you keep them before you start to see a decline in vigor? I'd say it probably depends on the vigor of the cultivar, how long they'll stay in a pot. When you start to see a real reduction in vigor and productivity, that's the time to swap them up. The same would apply, of course, in the ground as well. <coughs> but they will last in the ground a lot longer than they will in a pot. Yes? If you do get one that's reached its, its maximum time, is it, is it necessary to swap it, or do you just pull it out and cut, cut the roots and let it start again? Or? Um, so uh, the question was, if it's you mean in, a, in pot culture? So I guess maybe pot culture would be a little bit different, and I'm, I'm making this up as I go along because I'm not very expert. But um, the difference between a planting that declines in the ground and one that declines in a pot is it may be declining in the pot because of root uh, crowding, not virus problems. I mean, in four years you'd think it still had. So I would say this, and I hope she doesn't get mad at me for saying this. But in a pot. I would say it's possible to remove it, divide the uh, plant the way you would a perennial, and replant. Because we think that in that period of time, the virus issue would not have become a problem. If after 15 years, this year, primocane is declining in growth, then it's time to remove it and replant with virus free stock. So there's a little bit of a difference there. Yes, question? Um, in terms of sharing, um, okay, so I've never dug plants. But when I prune my berries, I give them sections of cane. Is that and then I plant the those and then they reproduce? So is that just as bad? Well, okay. So the question was, if you're sharing sections of canes, um, I'm. I would say the problem is that the virus, if it's present, viruses are present throughout all of the tissues of the plant. Phytophthora is restricted to the root system, so you would be avoiding by sharing shoot sections, um, I, I guess I've never tried to propagate raspberries that way, <laughs> um, but you would be avoiding the phytophthora problem because there were no roots, but you would not be avoiding the virus problem because those are present within all of the plant tissue. It's still better to buy disease-free stock. Yes? So I uh, did get clustermite over, so now I know I shouldn't have done that, but um, <laughs> if I if one does end up with virus, Okay, good question. So if it's a virus problem, um, can you still plant, can you remove the plants and replant at the same spot? The answer is yes. Because viruses are present in plant tissue, they're not soil dwelling. Phytophthora? No, that's a totally different matter. Um, so then you would want to move the planting somewhere where that had not been a problem prior, or you had reason to believe it would be a problem. Viruses, though, are usually either pollen or uh, aphid transmitted, um, so they are uh, present only in plant tissue. If you remove all the plant tissue, then your problems are gone. Okay, so uh, in the ground, on the other hand, uh, then uh, planting about two to two and a half feet apart in the row, uh, and then as you can see, uh, your new plants are starting to produce a primocane growth on this raised bed later on in the spring and summer. Um, raspberries, um, red raspberries, whether they are floricane or whether they're primocane growers, will need some kind of a trellis. The trellis is very little bit because of the uh, stature of the plants is different from floricane to primocane. Floricane, if they're vigorous, can produce canes up to 10 feet tall. Uh, so that's a vigorous planting of red raspberries. So because of that height and the spindliness of the individual canes, they need to be tied. Uh, and the recommendation here is if you have a simple trellis that's composed of posts and wires, that's really all that's required. The photo on the left here is just of your generic wire tightener. Um, it doesn't need to be a particularly stout or robust trellis. You just want to prevent those canes from falling over because as soon as those laterals start to form, they will fall over. So this typical trellis here has um, one or sometimes two top wires and sometimes wires lower down. Uh, as a way of corralling the primocanes as they grow during the growing season. 
So that's a simple trellis. You really only need one wire at the top at about six feet to tie your uh, canes to after you're done pruning. So very simple to construct. Um, so here we have an example of just a wire held in place with those little, um, those little clamps there. Uh, and then you can see the job of tying the private canes in the uh, dormant season or at the, in the late fall uh, when you're pruning out all of your old floor canes. So uh, cane management, as I mentioned, this is a suckering plant, whether it's primate cane fruiting or flora cane fruiting. So it's like, well, what are we going to do with all these suckers that arise everywhere that root system happens to go? Um, there's two ways of doing it. First of all, anything that's wider than the row is supposed to be should be removed. So it's, if it's in the between row area, where you're walking or where you're mowing or whatever, then those, of course, should be removed because you don't want your trellis to become, or your pardon me, not your trellis, your canopy to become too wide. So this one is considered to be a little bit too wide, and it's really just the, the, the growth in the middle is not getting exposed to very much sunlight, so your productivity is going to be that much reduced. So imagine the primocanes coming up through the middle of that, they won't be well exposed to sun, and it's a sun-loving plant, what will happen is they just won't be very... Uh, very productive of flowers or fruit. So keep the, the canopy as narrow as possible in order to ensure good light availability to all of the developing leaves and buds. So it's really not that much different from any other uh, fruit in that respect. It's, it becomes a little bit more complicated when you're talking in the row, though. So if you've got it down to a narrow width, so sort of like this, how do you manage the suckers within the row itself? And so there's a couple of ways to do that, um, which I'll describe. So this is one way, which is you're actually using a so-called hill system. So essentially what you're doing is you're planted two to two and a half feet apart, then you only maintain canes in that clump, two to two and a half feet apart, with a gap in between. So that's one way of doing it, which obviously involves uh, cutting out or hoeing out the suckers that occur between individual hills. So that's one way of doing it. The other thing they've done here is when they um, tie up the canes, they've also topped them. So that's another thing that you may or may not choose to do, depending on what your goals are. So this is what this looks like in the springtime when growth is beginning. So you have your hills, okay, they're distinct plants, but then, of course, the primate canes don't know what you're trying to do is create hills, and so they'll continue to grow everywhere that root system is. So this is a never-ending task each spring, and also, of course, during the summer, as the primate canes will continue to try to grow well into the, uh, well into the late spring or summer. So managing primate canes is a major part of pruning of summer-bearing red raspberries. The other thing you don't do, okay, on... Um, this is something you would do on something like a black raspberry, but not on uh, any of these red raspberries, is top the primate canes while they're growing. So you do all of your pruning of the canes themselves only when the dormant season has set on. Okay, so after they drop their leaves, that's when you do the pruning of the primate cane. So these are growing, and, and like I said, these are already uh, getting to be several feet tall. If it's a vigorous planting, you can easily expect 8, 10 feet of primate cane growth each growing season. And that's on multiple cane. So harvest is uh, in early summer. Like I said, these are June or early July bearing fruit. Uh, the fruit on the floor canes is born at the end of these laterals. Um, so here are the fruit. They're harvested uh, by taste. So kind of like an apple, you know, you harvest them when they start to taste right? And of course, they don't all ripen at the same time, so harvest occurs over a period of time on a given cultivar. After harvest, what will happen on the floor cane berry, or summer bearing red raspberries? Phil, oh, question? I have a question, yes. Um, I was told a long time ago that the thornless blackberries are just like raspberries. Is that not true? Or? Um, well, okay, so the question was thornless blackberries are just like uh, red raspberries. Um, there are thornless examples of both trailing and non-trailing blackberries. So I'm now you're starting to press my knowledge a little bit here. But <laughs> um, in
in, they're the same in terms of their pruning requirements? Yes. Okay, so in that, the thornless blackberries also have uh, biennial canes? Yes, that would also be the same. The problem is that the suckering is, uh, suckering occurs in some blackberries and not in others. So, uh, if we were to talk about blackberries, we'd have to have the same discussion as we would, would have if we were to talk about all the red raspberries, or the, all the raspberries, because some of them have characteristics that others do not. But it's all in the publications. <laughs> That's my fallback. <laughs> yes? I have a question about the suckers. Can you take those in and, and chop them off and replant them as part of the so the question was, can you, uh, on your own uh, land, uh, landscape, can you remove suckers from the plants and replant them? And I guess if you're doing it on your own property and they're vigorous and they're, you have no reason to believe there's any of an issue, the answer is yes. But what you need is, like any other suckering plant, is a section of root to go with that vegetative shoot. So it's, it's really not that much different from dividing a perennial. As long as you've got roots and you've got a viable vegetative bud, you have a viable plant. But no sharing with your neighbor. <laughs> uh, so after uh, fruiting is done, and so the, the next pruning on uh, uh, fluorocane red raspberries it occurs in, say, late August, September. As you'll notice, the foliage on the since-fruited fluorocanes is starting to decline. They'll get chlorotic, they'll start to turn brown. The canes are obviously in decline. So those fluorocanes should be removed at the end of summer or so. Right? There's no ideal time, I guess you could say, when you get around to doing it. Um, so those are spent, and they should be pruned out. And they're pruned out at the base of each of those plants. In a sense, this is easier on a hill system, as you can imagine, than on a hedgerow system, just because there's fewer of them to deal with. And it's easy to tell the difference between a fluorocane after you, you get down there. Um, down to ground level, um, usually it's pretty easy to tell the fluorocane from the primocane because the primocane is very green. I mean, it's very uh, actively growing young tissue. So they'll appear very green. The fluorocanes, on the other hand, tend to look very woody and brown. So it's usually pretty easy. You won't find yourself cutting out too many primocanes and going, oops. Um, they're pretty easy to tell apart at the base. So cut at the base, remove them all together from the plant. So this is what you'll deal with. Um, again, on a vigorous plant, you'll probably have eight or ten uh, fluorocanes to remove. And again, they look obviously distressed uh, at the time of removal. So once, once you've done that, what you're left with is your primocanes for next year's crop. So in this case, the, pot, the purpose of the bottom two wires is really just an opportunity to tuck them up, keep them from flopping around and being damaged for the remainder of the growing season before you get around to topping and tying them later on in the fall. So this is what that might look like. So here we have a, uh, a row of red raspberries, and this is in early September, and all of the primary floricanes have been removed. All that's left is the primocane. And notice the vigor. Look how tall that is. That looks like more like about, uh, about 11 or almost 12 feet. So it's a really vigorous planting. And notice that each plant produces a number of these canes. So the question is now, what do I do with all this growth? So this is uh, the, an equivalent sort of, notice an impressive raised bed here uh, with bark dust on it. Um, so this is what you might be dealing with in uh, early winter. So you take those canes and bundle them together, tie them at the, at the top once all the leaves have fallen off, and uh, just remove any other growth. If you're going, remember, this is a hill system. Uh, so you can see what they've done here in terms of pruning by removing the top of the cane and also tying them together. And this is that same planting I just showed you a picture of. And notice what they've done here. Rather than top them, they've taken that growth and tied it over as a sort of a tarp cane system. And the, the difference between that and topping them is when you top the cane, you, re, you remove any laterals, obviously, um, that might have occurred on that uh, section of the cane, 
And by doing that, you probably increase the fruit size on the remaining parts of the cane. It's sort of like a zero-sum game. But if you choose to arc cane, then you'll probably end up with more fruit. It's just that they might be a little bit smaller. So that's maybe the difference there. So it's a way of getting a little bit more productivity out of the given um, unit of row, I suppose you can say, by taking them and, and tying them over. So if you get this level of vigor, you're doing everything right, I'm telling you. So that's a good one. Um, so, following year, here's uh, what you'll see, what we all hope to see, actually. By the way, I don't think this cold spell is coming. It could be as cold as 20 degrees, which is, I've been here 32 years. I don't think I've ever seen temperatures that low predicted for the very end of February. This is unheard of. So I don't think red raspberries would suffer damage. Suffer damage. I'm a little more concerned about uh, trailing blackberries, which are the least hardy of the cane berries that one can grow. So if you have some type of trailing berry, this, this, this will be a bit of a test for those plants. Yeah. I wanted to ask if you were want to harvest leaves for raspberry and tea, when would you take the leaves? Okay, I'm going to put that one out to the audience here. The question is, if you're going to harvest leaves for raspberry tea, when do you harvest leaves? I will just say, you would probably harvest leaves from the lower parts of primocanes, but I don't know. Um, there's, uh, yeah, anyone? Harvest leaves from red raspberries for raspberry tea? I, I honestly don't know. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so, um, yeah, the buds here on the sides of the canes turn into these long laterals, and so at the tips of the laterals are produced the fruit. So that's a flora cane fruiting red raspberry in action. Okay, are there any last questions on the flora canes? Because I'm going to switch gears here to uh, primocane fruiting, which in some ways offer a little bit more flexibility than the floor fruiters <coughs> because of the curious way they have of uh, flowering and fruiting. So this is, um, in some respects, are the same, but they have this added twist to them. So primocane fruiting red raspberries are the same as uh, floor cane fruiting in that uh, the canes are biennial, but it's how they flower and fruit that distinguishes them. And how they flower and fruit is that they will have a tendency to produce both flowers and fruit at the tip of that primocane in that first growing season, which of course is different from a floricane fruiting type, which has to hold a winter. So what this means is they will produce fruit in that uh, first season, usually later on in the growing season than the floricane fruiters will do. Um, they're also, because of that curious characteristic, they stop growing and they will not produce the same level of vigor. So you won't get 8 or 10, 10 12 foot canes on a primocane fruiting red raspberry. When they start that process of flowering at the tip of the primocane, that stops further growth of that primocane. So they tend to be a little bit shorter in stature, meaning that you can get by with a more straightforward trellis and that tying that's necessary on the floor cane really isn't required. So a trellis for a primocane fruiter might consist of a post like this with a little side arm and then a pair of wires down each side just to corral those uh, canes as they grow. And again, once they do start to fruit, they'll have a tendency to want to fall over. This will prevent that process from happening. So this is a very simple little trellis. Um, again, a raised bed is a good idea. It's a raspberry. It wants to get root rot. But um, in general, um, it's a little bit simpler in terms of trellis. The same thing is required also with these suckers, is that you want to remove any excess suckers that will make your hedgerow too wide or your, um, usually these are, are grown as a hedgerow, but you don't have to do that, but make sure it's not too wide. Uh, it shouldn't be any wider than a foot or a foot and a half. For the same reason, light availability. So there's two options you have with a primocane fruiting red raspberry. One is to double crop them, okay, so an early crop on the floricane and a later crop on the primocane, or a single crop where you only produce fruit on the primocane. And the reason they get this name Everbearers is because you have that double cropping option. So rather than with a floricane where you get your fruit in June and July and it's done, with these you can potentially have a crop in both June and July and in August through October on those, um, on those canes. So here's what it looks like in full fruit on the tips of the primate. So the double crop, okay, here it is. This is a, uh, some variety, rather, of red-fruited 
probably came pretty red raspberry in fruit, full fruit in late summer. So they'll start in the round about the middle to late August and then continue really until frost or until we get so much rain that the fruit just don't develop and they start to develop a tendency to get um, fruit rot. So that's the season for a primocane fruiter grown only for that primocane fruit. So what happens is the, you get the fruit at the tip of the cane and then it stops growing. So in the dormant period, okay, you'll start to, oh boy, double crop. Oh. So this is where you're getting the uh, fruiting at the tip of the cane in the first year. You go into the dormant period, sorry I was getting ahead of myself, and then this part of the cane will die. So very much like a floor cane fruiter where the whole cane will die after it's done fruiting. In this case, only the tip, which has produced flowers. So like any other woody plant, the flowers only occur in one location on a single occasion, then they move somewhere else. Where they move to is down here. So just like a floor cane fruiter, that lower part of the cane will overwinter, okay? And it will fruit on that floor cane the next year. So that's why you get these two crops. So if you choose to do that, you find yourself managing both floor cane and prime cane at the same time on the ever-bearing red raspberry. So if you're going to do that, what you would do then is prune off the section of the cane that is fruited, leaving the lower part as we see here. So here they've pruned, and what's left is the buds on the, what's now the floor cane, um, which will produce laterals and fruit. Meanwhile, of course, the primate canes are growing up through here and will produce fruit above that and towards the uh, towards the end of the growing season. So that's how to do a double crop on a primate cane pruning red raspberry. The other thing that a lot of people do, and which makes the pruning really simple, is just to produce it only for that primate cane crop. Um, so you can grow a floor cane fruiting and a primate cane rooting res raspberries in the, in the same garden, and grow the floor cane ones for that summer crop, and just grow the primate cane fruiters for the fall crop, in which case the pruning becomes dead easy. Here's what it looks like in the dormant season, again, the tip of the cane is fruited, then you just go ahead and mow everything off, either with a pair of snippers, or if you choose, I mean, these are pretty robust plants, and the growing points are below ground, then you can use something like a, even like a string trimmer with a metal blade attached, yeah. just to remove all of the growth. So that removes all that remaining fluorocane, and so what will happen is you just grow it for that uh, late summer crop on the primate cane. So here they come again, your primate canes, um, and so that's the other thing that one can do. And again, either way, you only need that simple trellis in order to uh, grow the primate cane fruiters, either as a uh, single crop or a double crop. Um, uh, if you're growing in a raised bed, I guess we we got to what one o'clock? Are we done? Okay, good. <laughs> good. Um, uh, raised beds uh, or containers work well. I think we've already had that discussion. You saw Brittany planting into one of the uh, containers <laughs> earlier on. Uh, raised beds are not a, not a bad idea. Uh, raised beds made out of the soil uh, in the garden itself, or raised beds filled with some kind of potting mix or other porous growing medium. As you know, if you put soil in a raised bed without amending it heavily, it turns into concrete and becomes a terrible growing medium for anything. So. Uh, soil for raised beds has to be really, really heavily amended in order to work well and provide that drainage as well as a good growing environment. Um, so um, here's a uh, private cane fruiting raspberry in a uh, container. Uh, she's growing it for a uh, double crop. So you got the floor cane crop in late summer, or late June, I should say, and then the private cane crop still growing up through here. I think it's supposed to be a primocane right there. Um, so you can grow a double crop of primocane fruiting red raspberries in a container as well as floricane types as well. Again, the, um, the duration of production will be limited in a container just because those root systems are vigorous and they will outgrow the pot eventually. Fertilizer, people often ask again, oh, this is contained in the publication. Um, the three questions what people usually have are is, what's the correct type of fertilizer, what rate to use, and the best time of the year to add, to add the fertilizer. So the source can be either inorganic or organic. 
Raspberries take up nitrate types of nitrogen, so there's also ammonium types, NH4. Um, use any, or if you're going to use an inorganic fertilizer, then she recommends triple 16 as a simple balanced fertilizer. That's probably the most commonly available well balanced fertilizer. Um, organic fertilizers, as he points out here, all contain mainly ammonium, so that has to be converted to nitrate. And most have uh, other nutrients like phosphorus and potassium as, as well. It becomes more important to have those when you're growing in an inorganic, uh, or pardon me, an organic, uh, 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 not a, a soil environment. So it's, a, it's an artificial growing environment. Then uh, it's more important to have a complete fertilizer in that situation because the, the uh, potting mixes usually don't supply uh, a wide range of nutrients. So there's lots of options for organic fertilizers, uh, feather, soybean, cottonseed meal, and so uh, fish, of course, is one of the oldest and best known ones. Um, and also compost as well. Uh, so you can use compost as a mulch every couple of years, and as that degrades, of course, that becomes a good source of both nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, if it's going to be an organic fertilizer, then you do want to make sure the soil pH is correct. Um, as what will happen is these uh, organic sources will turn into nitrate, the form that they take up, if the uh, soil pH is appropriate. The amount to use, uh, nitrogen, as with all growing plants, is the most important nutrient needed by most uh, plants, including raspberries. The rate to apply will increase uh, from the planting year. Of course, as the plant gets older, then the rate has to go up. And the recommended rates in the publication are per season and for actual nitrogen, so the actual product rate itself. So I won't go into a whole lot of this, is obviously lifted right from the publication. Uh, but she does give specific rates for fertilizer, so two to two and a half ounces of actual nitrogen per 10 feet of row for a new planting, okay? And what that means in a practical sense is if you're using triple 16 as your inorganic source of nitrogen, and it calls for two ounces per 10 feet of row, then you could actually come up with the amount by dividing by the ratio 0.16. So two ounces divided by 0.16 is 12.5 ounces of fertilizer actual product per 10 feet of row. That's in the publication and is a key thing when you're trying to figure out how much fertilizer you have to do. Timing is, and this could also apply again with most woody plants, the fertilizer needs to be available to the plant just before growth starts in spring through midsummer. So the best thing to do is, of course, rather than dumping it all on one time, divide it in half and apply it uh, at two occasions, about a month to a month and a half apart. All right? Yes, questions? When you want to get rid of a variety of raspberry and plant a new one, what's the best way so they don't come up and get in them? So the question was, when you're trying to get rid of one variety of raspberry and introduce another one, what's the best way to dig them all up? If you get most of the root system, <laughs> it's, there's no easy way because that root system has to go because it's capable of suffering. With uh, black raspberries, with... Uh, trailing blackberries, of course, it's only necessary to get the crown. The roots are not an issue because they don't sucker. The problem with raspberries is that, of course, they do sucker. So your job is to uh, get as much of that root system as you possibly can. If you miss any, then hopefully uh, the new cultivar will have characteristics which are sufficiently different from the old that you can tell one sucker from another. I'm not going to say it's going to be easy, but if you choose to replant it in the same spot, it's just going to be a matter of digging until you run out of root system to dig up. Yes, question. Are raspberries deer resistant? Are raspberries deer resistant? No. <laughs> <laughs> there are few plants. I have this uh, funny picture I took at a nursery one time, um, which I need to find a presentation to put it in. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, it was, a, it was a visit in the wintertime. And they had these tables outdoors, you know, for all their different plants. Mm -hmm. One of them said, deer-resistant plants. And because it was winter, there's nothing on it. So I took a picture of that. <laughs> sure, they're deer-resistant. Uh, the more aromatic the plant, I think, if we wanted to sort of generalize, 
the more likely it is to be deer resistant. Uh, the beauty of this, uh, being, being in the Willamette Valley, unlike really challenging places to garden like California, or, you know, where it's hotter and drier, here they have so much to eat that it's just either naturalized or, 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 or native plants that the pressure is not as much. But if you see, if, if the deer get into your raspberry or other caneberry plantings, they will go to town. They're not deer resistant. Question back there. Um. I'm thinking that a primocane would do better in a pot than a, because it's more compact. Uh, so is that the question? That will a primocane for any time do better in a pot? Yes, I think. Yes, okay. Just because they're less vigorous, I would agree with you. So it's really just a question of vigor. The more, the, the quick, more quickly it just fills in and, and fills that pot with roots, once the root system has no more place to go, then you're going to start to see a decline in vigor. So yes, since they're less vigorous in theory, they would last longer in a pot. But eventually, I think they're going to require removal, division, and replanting. Yes? What do you do if you've got a pot in there and it's um, lifted up with root rot? What do you do with that soil? If you end up with, if you end up with, if you used a store-bought plant and artificial media for it, it would be very unfortunate to end up with root rot. But if it's root rot, then I suppose it's got to be disposed of as however one disposes in Benton County of infested soil. It can't be used in the garden. It can't be disinfested. The unfortunate thing about root rot is that it is very persistent in any soil. So that's why replanting is not a problem. What one would do with that, we would need to think about that. If it has to go to the landfill or what, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, other question. I thought there was another question back there. Okay. Uh, so, problems. Uh, this is something you may see on the west-facing side of your raspberry planting in particularly hot, sunny days. Um, this is UV damage. So the sun uh, on a very hot day, usually this happens when you get a really hot day after a period of cool weather, and what happens then, the, the sunburn on red raspberries shows up as these white droplets. They're still edible, but it's just kind of a curiosity. But it'll always be on the west-facing side of the, um, of the plant. So here it is. Here's more of it. Um, so always on the side of the fruit that faces the sun and always on the side of the, the planting, which also faces south or west. I mentioned viruses. Probably the most debilitating virus is this one called raspberry bushy dwarf virus, which is a pollen-borne virus. Um, and this is, uh, this is a, a meeker red raspberry, I guess, which uh, is very susceptible. So it causes these symptoms on the floricanes of the sort of intravenal chlorosis. Um, but more importantly, what it does is it uh, doesn't allow for proper fruit development. So you learn what, what causes what, what's called these crumbly fruit, which just disintegrate when you try and pick them. So again, it's a virus problem. It, you can't disinfest a infested plant, so it simply has to be removed and replaced. So this would be an instance where it's like, well, it's been fun, but it's time to move on uh, and buy virus-free plants from your local or online source if you see fit. This is the worst problem of all because it's not something you can just dig them up and replant. Um, this is a um, soil-dwelling fungus-like. It's neither fungus nor bacterium. It's somewhere in between, I guess. Uh, but Phytophthora rubra is the most serious disease problem because that puts you completely out of business. <laughs> um, so you'll notice a decline in the vigor of the planting overall, and then you'll start to see the collapse of uh, the floricanes and also the uh, lack of growth of primocanes as well. So these are classic symptoms of Phytophthora root rot. Again, I've seen this over and over again. Most of the time where you see it, it is in the ground, in ground pr production, especially on flat ground. And because it's wet here, because the drainage can be problematic in some of the soils, yes, you can have problems uh, in our soils, even though you do your best to amend them. That's why anything you can do to improve the drainage will decrease the likelihood that you run into a problem with 
I call it the root plot. But when you start to see symptoms like these, there's nothing for it but to remove the planting and consider, if you still want to grow raspberries, moving somewhere else in the garden. Is it most specific? And if you put some other plant in there, would it be susceptible to that? Nothing is as susceptible as raspberries, so I would say it's if you improve the drainage, and like a blackberry, I don't think I've ever seen blackberries with Phytophthora rot, which is not to say that they can't get it, but uh, certainly compared to problems with <coughs> red raspberries, there's like no comparison whatsoever. They just are super sensitive. What about Marion berries? Marion berry are trailing blackberry, so again, much more tolerant of, of uh, any type of um, clay soil than any raspberry. Yes? So the question was, you saw a little bit of it in, in the raspberry planting, but others were growing really well. I mean, it could be, or it could be that, uh, is it, I, I, I'm trying to think of a diplomatic way to say it, but it could be watering practices as well, you know, <laughs> that's the other thing. Uh, so, I mean, as Bernadine points out here, it can be confused with drought. So if there's anything that's limiting the uh, availability of water to the plant, then you'll see this as well. I mean, it's really just, the roots are no longer transmitting water, so the plant shows drought stress symptoms, so that as well. So I don't write it off yet, um, but if you're seeing differences among cultivars, that's totally consistent with how plants behave. Some are going to be more sensitive than others. Um, but yeah, far and away, the, the last thing you want to see in your raspberry planting um, is that. Um, be super careful with any herbicide around any rose family plant. Um, remember, the canes are only two years old at their absolute oldest. Um, and so anything like glyphosate, this is you know, glyphosate, also known, originally known as Roundup, but now known by many, many names. Uh, broadleaf weed control, um, the canes readily are affected by uh, these herbicides and others simply because they're really green material and that's what those products are designed to be absorbed by. Um, so since you have primocanes as well as floricanes on any red raspberry planting at any given time in the growing season, super susceptible and then, then you get these oddball symptoms on the canes. And again, that's a um, systemic herbicide, so not a good thing to, to expose your plants to. The other thing is this. this is Spotted wing this is the little fly. On the, when you see this on the leaves, that's not good. <laughs> so this is an invasive pest that showed up around 2009 or so. I remember seeing it actually for the first time on a primocane pruning red raspberry from a grower, a grower, a homeowner in West Salem. And they brought in these gooey fruits, wondering what the problem was, and what the problem was is that those gooey fruits were full of the larvae of the spotted wing drosophila, this little vinegar fly which has shown up. There's actually a, a pretty good description of spotted wing drosophila management in the PNW Insect Management Handbook. So there are therapies uh, for dealing with this. And there's new technologies, which if Bernadine were here, she could do a way better job of explaining. But OSU is actually at the forefront of research to help both um, growers as well as homeowners stay away from this problem. Because it does you no good to do everything right and then have these little buggers show up and infest all of your fruit. So there is hope. So just uh, a little bit to finish up here. Uh, Oregon natives, of course. Uh, also cane berries and also raspberries are the salmon berry, some of which have these lovely flowers, including a double flower form, by the way, of this. Um, but anyway, nice ripe fruit on that. Um, this is a photo I actually took on a hike in British Columbia of a native North American red raspberry, Rubus strigosus. That was kind of fun. And then, of course, Rubus parviflorus, the thimbleberry, um, which are yummy soft, but very yummy. So anywhere there's a lot of moisture, uh, you'll find thimbleberries growing very happily. And then lastly, um, the native black raspberry, which grows on our property west of Monmouth, as a matter of fact. It's a really beautiful ornamental in the wintertime because of the white canes. Uh, so if you're looking for like an informal uh, sort of native hedge, which has this nice presence in the winter because the canes are white and self-supporting, especially when they're top, you also get, well, the birds will get, unless you're very, uh, <laughs> very unless you net them, the birds uh, enjoy those fruits. So we find them popping up all around our garden. 
Yes, question? You didn't mention the marmorated stink bug. And I know at one point I was having problems with my fruit. But they don't seem to be having such a problem anymore. Okay, so yeah, brown marmorated stink bug uh, was uh, the question. Yes, brown marmorated stink bug could potentially be a problem. Um, I'm not so sure. Uh, I, I know that it can affect cane berries. I don't know the extent to which it does so. Uh, I know in our home orchard, on pears especially, it's very problematic, this poking little holes in the fruit which then fail to develop. Um, uh, the same damage on individual fruit of any cane berry, of course, would be problematic as well. Um, as you're also probably aware, management of brown marmorated stink bug is extremely difficult for commercial growers of any commodity, never mind homeowners. So I'm not sure that we have good therapies for brown marmorated stink bug management as yet. Yes. How much water do raspberries like? Um, that's a good question. How much water do they like is going to be dependent on the aspect, on the cultivar, on the soil conditions. Um, I'm not sure how much irrigation is discussed in the publication as far as water needs. I would say uh, keeping the soil around the root system uh, more or less consistently moist, whatever that involves, would be what was necessary. They are not tolerant of drought. So any period of drought is going to show up as symptoms on the foliage and maybe a reduction in growth. Yes? I have uh, the primatine variety. Yeah. Uh, it's a So it's a primocane fruiter, and you're growing it for the primocane crop only? Okay. So then, if the, the question was whether you, uh, if you have a primocane fruiter, should be, you be removing old canes? Um, Not just the canes, but the whole root of Oh, okay. So, in other words, should you grow it as a hill or as a hedgerow? Is that, is that what the question is? Because it gets so old that I need to dig up a root at all. Um, so, does raspberry growing ever get old, is the question. <laughs> no, I'm going to say no. Um, so the question was, should, should individual sections of the planting be removed altogether in order to invigorate it, or something of that nature? Um, so again, they're all biennial, so by clipping out those floor, if you're double cropping, you're going to be removing floor kids, right? As well as pruning in the late winter to remove the dead part of the primate case. Right? Those are the two pruning operations. Um, so I would say keep the hedgerow, if that's what you're growing, from getting too wide. That governs the pruning more than anything else. Uh, or sucker management more than anything else, I guess you could say. Um, if you're doing that, then I don't think it's necessary to thin within the actual remaining hedgerow itself. 